Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and, and uh, thank you for all for joining us. Uh, welcome to the second district town hall uh, focusing on business resources. We are excited to be with you this morning and uh, we are uh, featuring Supervisor Karen Spiegel, second district supervisor, as well as chair of the Riverside County Board of Supervisors. And you'll hear from her in just a moment. A uh, couple of informational items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the county's business and community services YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook page. And, and we'll share that information and links in the chat later. Also, if you have any questions during the webinar, please place those, those questions in the Q&A. I think most of you are familiar with how that works with Zoom, but it's at the bottom. There's a little panel that pops up and you can uh, uh, put your questions there. Any information, resources, links, phone numbers, emails, we will place those in the chat. But please place your questions in the Q&A section and we'll do our best to either answer those during the webinar uh, or after. And so at this point, it's my sincere pleasure uh, to introduce Supervisor Karen Spiegel. Supervisor, good morning. Well, good morning. And thank you to everyone that has joined the webinar today to learn about the various programs available to our business and nonprofit community. I would like to give a special thanks to our business partners, SBDC, as well as the Business and Community Services Department for putting it together this great panel of speakers. Special thanks to Rob and Suzanne with our uh, community service department. You guys are just incredibly awesome. And I hope that more of you reach out to the resources that are available to businesses. Before we get started and look towards the future, I would like just to take a moment to recap some of the great work the county and our partners have tackled this past year. Can you believe that it's been almost a year since the stay at home order? That is really incredible. Well, in that year, we have helped more than 5,000 businesses by awarding $10,000 grants as part of a business assistance grant program. We've allocated 1.5 million to our tourism recovery. We funded a business ambassador program to assist our business owners with COVID-19 readiness and reopening plans. We've distributed 10 million free masks to small businesses and nonprofits. We provided testing, training, PPE, disinfection, and quarantine for skilled nursing facilities throughout the county. Provided rental relief to 5,866 households, so far with 4,500 additional applications in process. Provided almost 500 grants up to 10,000 each for local nonprofits. Provided 70,000 bed nights of shelter to those in need. Generated 50 new beds of special needs transition housing and 107 units of affordable housing for farm workers. Gave 12 million to public and private schools to combine um, to help that, that digital divide. We wanna bridge that. We created and implemented a pathway to employment and youth community core to provide on the job training and job placement skills with a weekly stipend. And delivered over 1.3 million meals to our seniors, just to name a few. As you can see, we've been busy, but our work is far from over. Our focus is on the horizon, the days ahead and the recovery of our regional economy. Small business is the foundation of Riverside County's economy. With 96% of our county's 68,000 plus businesses having 50 or less employees. 77% of the county's small businesses have one to four employees. 62% of the county's small businesses are in the service and retail sectors. Our small business community has been devastated by the pandemic and the county along with partners have been available to help. Today, we are partnering with Mike Daniel and his team from the Orange County Inland Empire Small Business Development Center to provide the latest information about a variety of programs available. You'll hear about funding from the Small Business Administration, such as Disaster Loan, Paycheck Protection Program, Shuttered Venue Operator Grants. The county has, been, has a business ambassador program to help businesses understand the state requirements for reopening and how the, to implement health and safety protocols for your business. So many businesses have been forced to restructure and pivot with a new business model. The county recognizes and supports innovation. Stay tuned for more information about Riverside County Innovation Month. If you're interested in monthly updates, 
please sign up for our newsletter. The link will be put in the chat box. And if you're interested in the District 2 email updates for our leadership, please send your email address to district2 at rivco.org. And with that, I thank again all of you for joining us. And I'll turn the meeting back to Rob Moran for a few updates from Riverside County Business and Community Services Development Partner. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Supervisor. Appreciate uh, uh, your words and everything that uh, uh, you've done over the last year. It's certainly been unprecedented for, for all of us. And uh, thanks to your leadership and your colleagues on the Board of Supervisors for allowing us to, to implement these programs. We've, we've been all been forced to be to pivot and be creative and innovative in the way that we deliver services. And um, uh, it, it's critical that we help our small business community. So thank you again. So I'm gonna share, we got a, an action packed agenda today, folks. So as the supervisor mentioned, we've got Mike Daniel and his team from the Orange County Inland Empire Small Business Development Center. Uh, we are blessed to have them here and they've got great services. So I'm gonna go through a few items that the county um, can offer sort of through our, our COVID-19 response as well as kind of what we call regular programming as we uh, hopefully see light at the end of the tunnel. However, we recognize that there is still a uh, tremendous, tremendous impact to our small business community. Again, just a reminder, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, and that way we can tackle those. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And um, uh, so hopefully everyone can see the the slide show uh, that should say Riverside Business and Community Services. So uh, the county's economic development and business assistance programs are primarily housed in our business and community services department and our economic development team. And uh, we uh, have been uh, obviously very, very busy over the last year with response, including some of the items that the supervisor mentioned, uh, providing support and resources to impacted businesses, including our $50 million grant program and our business ambassador program, which is still going on. And I'm gonna share a little bit about that in just a moment. Uh, but we do have other uh, services and programs that we want our business community to be aware of. Uh, and, and most of you, I, I hope are engaged uh, with your trade associations or chambers of commerce, and that's probably why you're here, um, or the supervisor's office, but we want to ensure that you continue that engagement. And that's, you know, a critical, not just a first step, but an ongoing um, a part of, I think, your, your business uh, 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 involvement. Uh, COVID response. As we mentioned, there's been a, a, a ton of things going on in the last year and still going on. And the supervisor mentioned our business ambassador program, and we started this program because, as we all know, there's been, you know, sort of the, the dimmer switch or toggle switch or however you want to characterize it with state regulations and, uh, you know, the different colored tiers and what can remain open and what has to be closed and what levels of, op, you know, what percentages. And so we started a business ambassador program that has county um, uh experts, including folks from public health, environmental health, uh, our transportation and land management agency to help businesses uh, access information on safe, not only reopening, but operating guidelines. Uh, we can do simple things like provide masks. We have hand sanitizing stations that we can offer you at no cost uh, for businesses that have a retail location. Uh, but more important is we will do either a virtual consultation uh, or an in-person consultation. And we've had many repeat customers as this whole pandemic has evolved, where we will go out and meet with you and, and take a look at your operation and, and offer recommendations and guidance on how to properly reopen uh, and keep operating. Uh, it is at no cost. You're already investing in these programs and services. You can access that at our website, which you'll see at the end of my presentation. Um, and you can sign up and we'll, we'll have a consultation. And usually it will be within a couple of days, we'll get that. Uh, we'll either come out to you, we can do it virtually, like I said, or we can even do a phone consultation. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, I know it can be daunting to understand these, these regulations and how to open and what you can do and what you can't do. And, and we are here to help guide you and provide information. Our economic development services are primarily driven through our, um, our business uh, development centers. We have three physical locations, although you can access any of these services virtually as we have been for most of the last year, uh, primarily in, they're based in Riverside, 
French Valley, which is in Southwest County in our Indio offices. But again, we're virtual and um, we, we normally come to you when, when we're able to do that. Uh, we do uh, offer a variety of, of programs and services, our small business services, which you're gonna hear more about here coming. So I, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, one of the things that we will help you do is we can help you find sites. You can do this on your own online through our Rivco Prospector site. But as you're, if you're looking to increase downsize, just find another location, Riverside County. We will help do that for you. Um, we know that one size doesn't fit all. So whatever your needs are, we can help find a location that, that suits your needs in Riverside County. So don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can help talk that through, you know, what's involved in a site search, what considerations you, you should, um, you should uh, uh, be concerned about. Financing and incentive zones. Uh, the county uh, can help you access different types of financing. Again, some of that you're going to hear about. I'm not going to talk about PPP or IDLE. Mike is, and his team will touch on that. Uh, there's bond financing for nonprofits and manufacturing companies. Of course, the traditional SBA loans. The county actually operates two loan programs. We have funding, a microloan program up to $25,000 and our Riverside County Revolving Loan Fund. And this is through federal funding. And you can, again, get more information. One is up to 25,000, which is the microloan program. Um, they have deferred payments and low interest rates. And the microloan is actually forgivable. And that has some requirements, but you can take a look at those and we can help talk you through those. And then our revolving loan fund, which starts at 15,000 and goes up from there. Typically, it's 15 to 30 to $50,000. Um, again, we have six months deferred payments can go more depending on the situation. 3.75% interest rate. That's part of a, a grant program that we, we receive from the federal government. There's loan programs if you're involved in recycling, reduction of waste or the processing of waste. We can help through, you know, help you figure that out as well. Venture capital, if you're in that space, kind of in the tech space. And then EB5 and export impact, uh, imp, excuse me, export import bank um, programs for international trade. I'll touch on that a little bit. Foreign trade zones. Uh, so there's different incentive zones in, in Riverside County uh, and, and incentives that are available to you, including uh, California competes, opportunity zones that offer benefits to investors. We have 49 of those throughout the county. There's sales tax exemptions for manufacturers that purchase equipment. And again, the recycling market development zones, which offer help to those that are in the waste reduction or conversion um, uh, business. And so there's a, a ton that's out there that we want to help spread the word and share that for you because a lot of times people just don't know about it and they're not able to access it. Um, our international business office specializes in helping uh, businesses that are exporting and importing or that would like to. We have foreign trade zones in our county that offer duty deferrals or reductions, depending on the type of business activity. Um, and for those of you that are interested in getting into that space and maybe selling your, your, your uh, uh, products abroad, uh, or you need help importing a supply of some sort, we can help you with that. There's specific types of financing for international businesses, and we have an office that is dedicated to that. And we'd love to, to help you with that as well. Workforce development services, this is really, really important. Um, labor is your number one asset. And so we have programs that will help businesses uh, identify and recruit. Uh, we know it, it can be a, uh, normally it's been a tight labor market. Um, so it's, it, you, you need help finding the right employees. There's even programs that'll help, help offset the cost are on the job training programs, which will pay 50% of the wages for a specific period of time to help offset the training costs um, if you're retraining employees, the employment training panel will also um, uh, assist in paying 100% of the costs of the training that comes through the state. Uh, and again, these are programs you're already investing in through your state and federal tax dollars, and they're at no cost to you. Uh, and also, it, sometimes it's unfortunate, as has been the case over the last year, but even during normal business cycles, um, you have to make adjustments to your workforce. There are programs that can help the business as well as the employees that are affected, and we have services available for those folks. So if we don't know how to do it, we have a ton of partners, and you're going to hear from some of those in just a moment. This is just a partial list. This is really all I could fit. Um, as I mentioned early on, uh, I think your engagement with, you know, your your industry trade associations and your chambers of commerce, I know many of you probably already, already are members, 
is really, really critical. And in the second district, you've got some fantastic chambers of commerce, Corona Chamber of Commerce, Riverside Chamber, Eastfield, Norco, Harupa Valley. And it's the best form of advertising you can get at a very, very reasonable cost. They advocate on your behalf. They help connect you with resources such as these. So I can't say enough about staying engaged or getting engaged with those types of organizations and those partnerships are critical. And that's probably part of the reason that you're here. And so with that, uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us, to myself and Kim, we've got a whole team of folks, but these are your primary contacts. And for some reason, my number came out bigger and it's, uh, but anyway, uh, feel free to give us a call. We'll also put this, I think in the chat. And so thank you again for being with us and I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it over to, to, uh, uh, to Mike, Daniel and his team. Perfect, thank you so much, Rob. And thank you so much, Supervisor Spiegel for including us in this presentation. So we are gonna go through a large amount of information here. And so as we go through this, uh, there is a Q&A box. We'd love for you to ask questions as we're going and we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, but I have a team of experts. We have Paul Nolta, who runs our Inland Empire SBDC Net, or Center, um, covers rivers, all of Riverside County, except for Coachella Valley, and parts of San Bernardino as well. We have Craig Russum, who is our finance lead. And we have Carrie Armstrong, who works out of a few of our centers and is an expert in leases and is going to talk you through everything you need to know about your current commercial lease and some things that you should be thinking. Um, so with that, let me just quickly go through the, the eight things that we're gonna talk about today, and I apologize, there are a lot of different programs out there from the federal side to the state side to local. So we wanna make sure that you know everything that's out there. We're not gonna be able to describe them all in depth, but what we do wanna do is just make sure you're aware of what they are. And then as you're asking questions, we're gonna give you some numbers that you can call us and we will help you through any and all of these programs one-on-one -on -one, um, based around what your business needs are. But we're gonna cover PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, I'm sure you know a year ago, no one knew what that acronym was. Everybody knows what these acronyms are now. Uh, we're gonna go through the IDLE and IDLE Advance and what, the, what that looks like. We're gonna talk a little bit about shuttered venues and employer retention tax credits. We're then gonna get into what you need to know about your commercial lease. We're gonna talk about the California Relief Grant and the California Rebuilding Fund. And then we're gonna talk about how to connect with the SBDC and how we may be able to help you. So with that, I'm gonna start with Craig Russum. He's gonna talk about the Paycheck Protection Program, um, there's some new regulations that came out yesterday. He's going to talk about what the what the second draw is, what the first draw is, and you know anything that might be going on. And so we're going to turn it over to Greg Russell. Greg, great. great, thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'll share my screen. Let's pull up some information about the Paycheck Protection Program, otherwise uh, the PPP. Uh, that uh, originally came out last year, end of March, early April of 2020, and it really was a response to try and help business owners uh, keep employees employed, keep them engaged in the workplace, and ultimately help you uh, as a business owner uh, cover some of those payroll costs and, and also other costs associated with your business. Uh, this year, in January 11th, they did uh, open up a round two, or some people are calling it PPP 2.0, or the second bite of an apple, however you want to see it. But that's what it is. It, it allows you as a business owner that if you took advantage uh, of the program last year, uh, an opportunity to uh, reapply for additional funds. Okay, so that's what's being considered as a second draw. Um, and so there, there's some misconception about these differences between that first draw and second draw. So we'll talk first about the, uh, the second draw. So those folks, um, whether you were self-employed, um, independent contractors, uh, business owners with employees, uh, and you participated in the PPP program last year, you now have an opportunity to go back uh, and apply again. Uh, the recommendation would be to go back to your original lender who funded you uh, first round. Uh, it seems to be the, the path of least resistance as far as they have the information on hand. They approved you before. Um, they understand you as the business owner. Um, it, it's not always the case. You know, some folks are venturing away from that lender for whatever reason um, and uh, looking elsewhere, which you can do. You can apply to a different lender. But uh, what we're seeing as far as data coming in, uh, if you can go back to the original lender that funded you first time, uh, it seems to be uh, the choice, uh, the better choice to make. 
A couple of things to understand though, with the second draw, there are certain qualifications for you that you have to adhere to. Uh, the, the, the top line one, the one that uh, most folks have been talking about is this having to show a 25% reduction in gross receipts, okay? From year over year, so 2019 to 2020. My recommendation here would be to um, have your 2019 uh, profit and loss if possible, but really all they're looking is top line revenue. So um, sales and of goods or services, so any top line number, if you can have that by month uh, or by quarter, and then also 2020, as we're looking to close out 2020, the same thing, okay? You're gonna need to put together uh, your top line revenue numbers for 2020 and do a comparison uh, to your 2019 numbers. And somewhere for most of us here in California, it was Q2. Uh, so the quarter, the second quarter was where uh, we had to shut down. Uh, we have April, May, and June. Um, and so that timeline comparatively to 2019, we saw at least a 25% reduction in top line revenue. And uh, that's it. We just need one quarter. So it's not the whole year. Uh, we don't need uh, the whole year's worth of data unless the lenders are asking for it. Uh, but that would be my first step in, in seeing that if you qualify to make sure that uh, you have at least a 25% reduction. It, it's, it's, it's tough for me to swallow as a business consultant to think that you know if you're a 20% reduction that you're considered a success story uh, and you don't qualify, but that unfortunately was uh, the, the criteria that they decided to use. So you did need to show a 25% reduction in order to qualify for a suck in draw. Uh, also, it is only open for 300 employees or less, which was a change from 500 employees. Uh, and also um, publicly traded companies aren't eligible. There's some other pieces like that that may exclude you. Uh, they did add the 501c6 though. Okay, so they did add a, a, a different uh, nonprofit designation. Some of our chambers operate as C6s, so that was good to see uh, that um, that is open now for second draw applicants. Other changes from last year is that uh, there is a chance you may be eligible for three and a half times of your monthly payroll, uh, where last year was two and a half times. So as a second draw applicant, there may be a chance that uh, you're eligible for three and a half times. And this is going to be uh, for folks with a business code of 72. So those, uh, it's typically um, the, the hospitality sector, uh, that um, food service hospitality that's gonna be eligible for in, in the 72. Uh, it's something that you'll work through on your application uh, with on the portal from your lender. Okay, so that's uh, second draw. Again, if you, if you think you qualify, uh, I highly recommend it. It, it, it does allow you to, uh, again, help cover your payroll costs and uh, from eight to 24 weeks. And uh, also they opened it up that other 40%. So as of last time, it was 60-40 split, 60% needs to go towards payroll. And then the other 40% can go towards other expenses such as um, some insurance, group health. They did add a few uh, line items that are, that are eligible for that other 40% now. Uh, in addition to rent, uh, property damage. So if your business experienced any property damage, uh, also open it up to supplier cost, which is kind of an open line item as far as how the money can be used. And then also PPE. So if any personal protection equipment that you had to purchase for your business, the funds are now eligible to be used uh, for that 40% um, coverage. Okay, so that is all second draw. First draw applicants, so this would be any business or self-employed individual who did not take advantage of PPP last year, okay, so all the way through December of 20, uh, December 27th was the last date, uh, that if you did not receive funding last year, then this is an opportunity for you to now participate in the PPP or the Paycheck Protection Program as a first draw applicant, okay, they, you do not have to show a 25% reduction in gross top line revenue. Okay, that's a big difference between a first or a second draw applicant. As a first draw applicant, you just need to um, agree or attest to or certify that your business has been adversely affected by COVID. Okay, so, uh, but again, I would recommend that you go with your current business bank. Um, if you have that relationship, it's again, that seems to be the path of least resistance. 
as far as the paperwork, them understanding who you are, you already have an existing account with them. Um, if not, then you are free to go out elsewhere. I, I guess I think there's over 5,000 participating lenders uh, in the Paycheck Protection Program. So whether you look uh, some of the fintech companies like a, a Bluevine or a Lendio or Cabbage or Intuit or PayPal, like there's a whole list of other uh, lenders out there that, um, but again, recommendation would be to go with your existing business bank account uh, provider now, um, see if they're participating and then look online for their application to uh, apply for the first draw PPP. Um, this, you know, it, it's been a successful program in helping keeping your employee and keeping uh, the employees engaged in the, in the workplace. And uh, now it's slated to continue through March 31st. Uh, as of today, I believe we're about halfway through the funds that have been approved uh, for this program. So I, I wouldn't wait on uh, putting your application in. It's, it's one of those instances where, you know, get your application now because it does take time to get through it. Uh, you do have to uh, provide some documentation. It has to go to the SBA to, to get approved and then come back to the lender ultimately to get funding. So it, it can take you know, three weeks. Um, it can go much quicker. So I would recommend getting into the process as soon as possible. Some of you may have heard uh, yesterday the Biden administration uh, announced some proposed changes to the PPP program. Uh, for the most part, most of these rules were already in place. They're, they're just, uh, they haven't been emphasized and they feel that uh, some time needs to be taken to help educate folks on the program. Uh, the, the, the big one here, this one up top, is the, uh, a two week or 14 day period in which the lenders, uh, or in essence, the SBA is only going to review those businesses with fewer than 20 employees for the next two weeks. Okay, so, uh, if you have more than 20 employees, I'm still putting my application in uh, so that the lender has it and you can continue to work through it. But what this is doing is that it's um, it's forcing the lenders then to focus on the smaller businesses right now and to push those applications to the SBA for approval at the SBA level. Okay, It doesn't stop the banks themselves from accepting applications and start working through them. They're just not able to push up to the SBA for the next couple of weeks so they can focus on these smaller businesses. Okay. Here's some of the other proposed rule changes. Again, most of these things are already in place. They're just trying to emphasize them. They're trying to provide more guidance uh, and better understanding about you know, who this program is, is available to. Okay, So um, even if you've had um, a, a felony in the past, you, know, you may still qualify. Even if you're a non-citizen and you're a small business owner, you may still qualify. Okay, And those that are delinquent on federal student loans, you may still qualify for the PPP. Okay, so I know some folks who felt like they, they might have fallen into one of these boxes and didn't qualify for this federal program, you, you can. Okay, so my recommendation is something like this is fill out the application, go through the process, work with the lender, and ultimately, you know, let them say no. Okay, take advantage of this program. It's been successful in helping with uh, your business and your employees. Okay. Do we want to target any questions now on PPP or are we going to wait to the end? I think I think if you want to go to the idle advance now. Okay. All right. So let's talk idle. The economic injury disaster loan, um, it, just like the PPP last year, end of March, early April was a program that came out to help businesses uh, provide funding for sales general and administrative type costs. This is a loan program. Okay, unlike the PPP, there is no forgiveness component to the idle itself, the economic injury disaster loan. But uh, at a 30 year amortization, 3.75% interest rate, uh, it is a very attractive loan with no fees. So, where the uh, some of the confusion that's come out with the idle now is that the $20 billion that was reallocated to the idle program, but it wasn't to the idle itself. So if you took out an IDOR, an economic injury disaster loan last year, this isn't an opportunity for you to go back and reapply or ask for more funds. Okay, so let's be clear. This portal from the COVID-19 relief.sba.gov uh, website is direct from the Fed money. You don't go to a lender for it. Okay, and it is open. This application process is open until the end of the year for new applicants. 
Now, if you did take advantage of the program last year, what this extra $20 billion is for is the targeted idle advance, <coughs> excuse me, idle advance. If you recall last year, the idle advance, they were paying out $1,000 per employee, up to 10 employees. Uh, if you filled out an application up to about July 7th or so is when the funds ran out, I think it's July 11th. So if you did receive a partial idle advance, this was the grant portion of this program. It's separate from the, uh, the economic injury disaster loan itself. Okay, so say you received $4,000 through the idle advance program. There, there may be uh, an opportunity for you to receive the additional $6,000 through the targeted idle advance program. This is where the $20 billion is going. So how do I receive that money? Well, you have to wait for the SBA to invite you to a portal. Okay, so there's nothing for you to do. There's no application for you to fill out. There's nobody to call to try and get in line for the targeted idle advance. The SBA is going to reach out to folks and start sending them an invite to the portal. What does the, the invitation look like? Okay, up on my screen here, it's coming from the targeted idle advance at sba.gov. So if you wanna do a search in your email box, look them in your spam folders, wherever, this is what the email is gonna look like. It's very specific to your application. Okay, and it's going to talk a little bit about the program, who qualifies, Okay, some additional details, and then ultimately you're going to click on a link. And, and I'll, I'll take this half a second to remind folks to please be careful of clicking on links in your email. Okay, we see it. We see it every day. There's spam and spoof emails out there. And so please be sure that it's coming from the targeted idle advance at sba.gov website. And then make sure if you click on that link or hover over that link and make sure that it is going to an sba.gov website. This is what then your portal would look like. Again, it's directly associated with your original application number, and it's gonna ask for an EIN, a social security number that's associated. So you, you can't give this to your friend, you can't have your friends invite and try and apply for the, the targeted idle advance. At this point, they are gonna ask for some additional uh, top line revenue information, and then work through to see if you are truly eligible for this program. So to be clear, even if you're invited to the portal, doesn't mean that you're automatically going to qualify. Right. They're going to first target those folks who receive the idle advance and then work through those. And then those applicants who did not receive an idle advance, then they'll start to get invited to the program. Um, there's 20 billion. Not sure how far that's going to go. Uh, it is, it's a great opportunity for those folks that are invited and who are ultimately eligible. Things that they're looking for for eligibility is that you are located a low income community. Okay, and that you can demonstrate a more than 30% reduction in top line revenue. Okay, they did finally um, publish a map, which I don't know if it'll come up. So you can check your zip code and you can try and look to see if you are located indeed in a low income community. I would say even if you do not and you're invited to the portal, I'm still going to fill out the information. And again, I'll let them say no. We don't know how far the 20 billion is going to go. Okay, so might as well get the application in if you're invited to the portal and let the SBA say no. But they did finally publish a map for us to kind of get an idea of what they're thinking with regard to uh, what they consider uh, low income communities. Okay, and that is available on the website directly from the SBA. Okay, so that's PPP idle as we are today. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to answer anything for you. You can always reach me directly at the SBDC as well. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Craig. And can you populate that into the chat as well, those links, so that yep. people can grab them? Okay. And Craig, I'd also ask just real quick if you might take a look at some of the Q&A and see if there's anything you can answer uh, as well. well. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to move on. Um, and quickly cover two, two programs that are out there and available, but there's still a lack of information for, for complete clarity of what these are. The first one is the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant. And this is brand new from the SBA. This will act very similar to an idle loan where it will actually come out through the SBA. Um, let me start with you know, who can actually apply. So these are eligible entities such as a live venue operator or promoter, theatrical producers, live performing arts organization operators, relevant museum operators, zoos and aquariums, motion picture theater operators, talent representatives, 
Um, and each business entity owned by an eligible entity that also meets the eligibility requirements. That If that's not government for you, I don't know what is on that last sentence, but uh, this, these are still being written, these rules as to what it is, but just to kind of go into some of the basic facts about what this will, what you might qualify for, if you happen to fit into one of those eligible entities, it would be up to 45% of your gross earned revenue from 2019. So let me restate that. So it's up to 45% of your gross earned income in, uh, in 2019, right? So there, this is pre-COVID. So this is a large amount of money, right? So think if you're a theater, with seats, and let's just say you know did a million dollars in 2019, you'd qualify for $450,000 of a grant, right? These are grants, not loans. Um, there is roughly $15 billion in this, and they have set aside the first two billion um, to go to businesses that are less than 50 employees. Now, we're still trying to learn all the facts about this, so there's some information that we're still missing as well. Um, but there's one small, one large caveat to this, and you know, Craig, if you want to jump on as well is that you cannot receive PPP round two and this at the same time, right? You have to pick one or the other, which makes it difficult, right? Because we don't actually know what shuttered venues operator grant consists of. So you may wanna hold off if you're applying for PPP and you fit into one of those eligible entity structures um, to, to, to figure out you know, wh which one may be better, right? Do the math, right? Most likely the 45% of your 2019 is gonna be much higher than two and a half times your, your monthly average payroll but you need to go in and, and we will definitely help you through this. Um, the hope here is that they're gonna get some clarification around the language of this grant opportunity um, in, in the next week or two, uh, but there's nothing out there yet. Um, and, and Craig, I, I don't know if you've heard anything, but I have not heard anything about whether, you know, even if you apply for PPP, some of the language states that even if you just applied for, for round two, that you may not be eligible for this. So it's a difficult one to, to know, right? I mean, sometimes you, you gotta think through having some money now versus, you know, waiting to see. Um, and unfortunately, this is the worst case scenario to put you in is to have to choose. But um, this is kind of where we're at. You can go, I'll, I'll put the, the, the information on this in the chat so you can get there directly. Um, but as soon as we have more information, we will get this out to everybody because this is a huge opportunity for a lot of, you know, the live venue operators that, that, have, that have been shut down for a long period of time, right? I mean, over a year for, for some, some businesses. So, um, We'll get you as much information as we possibly can. Um, and I'm going to quickly jump into the employer retention tax credit or the ERTC. I said the government likes to ac put an acronym to everything. So the employer retention tax credit, originally you could not receive paycheck protection program round one and this, uh, but now you can actually go backwards and you can receive some tax credit um, on the federal side for your employees, if you were able to retain employees. Uh, now, if you if you paid for them for, through PPP and it covered their whole amount, then you wouldn't qualify for any of this, uh, but you may qualify for a second part, right? So the first part is what you paid for in 2020. The second part is what you're paying for in the first two quarters of 2021. Um, so if you go backwards, it's up to a credit, a tax credit of up to $10,000 per employee. Um, that is a, right, it's, it's a tax credit, right? So if if you owe money, it reduces it. If you don't owe money, you get a check back from the federal government, right? So this is huge. And this is a misunderstood uh, program that a lot of people don't understand through the IRS, right? So um, I'm gonna tell you this up front that you should absolutely contact your CPA or your accountant. They should know about this program and they will be able to assist you as to the best solution of, of what you may be able to, to take advantage of. Um, and then as we move forward, it's $7,000 per quarter for the first two quarters of 2021. So this is significant uh, funding back into your business if you fit and you qualify into some of these pieces. Uh, and so there's gonna be some, some thought process here as to how you, how you might take advantage of PPP and earn, uh, employer retention tax credit together, right? You may not want to, to exhaust all 100% on payroll for the PPP and maybe the 60%. And I keep in mind, the forgiveness on PPP is at minimum 60% on payroll. The other 40 could be used for rent and operating expenses. So you really wanna think through this and we will definitely help you kind of put some thought together as to what you might be able to take advantage of. But if you have 10, 15, 20 employees, um, this could be tens of thousands of dollars back in your pocket um, if you do this correctly. So just wanna make sure that you're aware that this exists. Again, I will populate the information here. Um, this is definitely something you're gonna to wanna to talk to an accountant, a CPA about so that you truly understand where your business may fit. Every business is a little bit different, really kind of based on wages and how much you pay your employees and then what you took advantage of for PPP round one 
and possibly for round two as to, you know, kind of playing out the scenarios of what you may qualify for. But two programs that they're still pretty new out there, but you're, you are going to need to take advantage of, of the first part pretty quickly. Um, so with that, I will populate this into the, into the chat box and I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Armstrong, who's going to talk about leases and your commercial lease and some things that you need to be thinking about um, as you move forward. So with that, Carrie. Okay, let me share my screen here. Good morning, everybody. Um, we are gonna talk about leases. I, uh, my background is shopping center management for 25 years. I've been with the SBDC for 10. And um, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of conversation around rent relief and that's really not what this is just about. This is really about how we're thinking about leases going forward. There's five areas. I like sorting things out into buckets. So I, there's five areas of importance that I think that we really need to focus in on. One is the timing. And that has to do with whether or not you have a lease currently or whether you're looking for one. I was really encouraged to hear Rob talk about the services they have out of the county to help site selection and things like that if you want to move into the Riverside County. So um, that's awesome. So the timing of when you're going to move in, the financial position of your business, of your cash flow, um, let's and we need to look at whether it's rent relief or rent alignment um, or realignment assignment and subletting and then the final group is going to be disaster and pandemic mitigation all right so we're going to dive into this really quick so the timing so when we look at timing we want to look at the term of the lease if you're already in a lease we need to understand what the term left is right or if you're going into a lease what is the term that you have left if you're already in a lease and you're having trouble a lot of the rent relief conversation that i'm having with landlords right now i'm with with clients is that look i may only have a year left on my lease or i only may have eight months left on my lease or maybe i have five years left on my lease so what does that mean and if i'm in that spot where maybe i only have a year and a half for two years and that's not long enough to pay back some of this deferred rent maybe we could do an early renewal strategy and get benefited from that by taking maybe a early signing bonus and get two free months instead of them calling it abatement right or maybe we can add to the term of the lease and so that you can pay down the deferment in a timely way if your business is viable. So we want to look at how to structure options. Um, I have a lot of people that are really nervous right now about renewing their lease because they're like, well, I, I don't really know where this is going. I mean, I'm, by the skin of my teeth, I just barely got through this. And so, so now what am I going to do? I don't want to re it for another five years. Well, what if we did three two-year options, right? And be smart about that or or a one-year option and then look again. So let's think about that because going month to month is super risky, right? And the reason it's risky is because you can have the carpet pulled out from under you in a red hot second. I mean, maybe that's what you don't mind that, but, but, but going forward, it's really hard. And the landlord is less likely to give you a deal if you're on month to month. Chances are you're paying a lot more because um, that's, that's, the, that's the benefit of having the ability to leave anytime, right? And so when you don't have the security of staying and, net, and negotiating with your landlord, whether it's a new lease or an, or, um, an existing lease, it, there's just no wiggle room in there and there's no time to pay things back. So landlords get really, really, really kind of funky over whether or not they're going to help you with any kind of rent abatement or deferment or, or rent relief at all. Now, the time of the year is super important, right? I had people that were saying, well, you know, I, I'm really looking to start building out. I really want my, my goal. I've got one right now. Right? He wants to do, um, it's a cider press tasting room. They're going to add a restaurant to it because, of course, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it was very difficult. We found out to stay open if you didn't have food associated with it. And he's like, is this the right timing? And the project he's looking at isn't even going to be ready for probably 18 months, right? Because the, the landlord has to do their thing. And so then also, he's got to get his financing together. It's going to take him another year to build out because and manufacture the cider. So by the time he's open, we're looking at two to three years from now. So the timing on that is probably pretty safe. Do we want to go in and immediately start something that is going to wind up um, still being closed, right? That happened to so many of our clients. I have so many clients that, you know, they grand opened in March or they thought in March, if they started, you know, getting their business together, they could open in July only to be closed back down. So we really want to watch the timing and don't forget about seasonal timing, right? Because there's certain times a year that it's better for you to open up. If you're opening up for the holidays and you're a retailer, of course, that's the time to do it. But, um, you know, if, if, if you're opening at the wrong time, then we really need to negotiate those terms with the landlord so that you're not paying rent in, a, in the worst downtime possible. Okay. 
So selling season and definitely, like I said, related to the COVID restrictions, my crystal ball looks like a snow globe. I don't know when all of this is going to clear up, but I do know that I have common sense and so do you. And we could kind of extrapolate out a little bit about what might, might open up and what might look good. The other thing is don't forget about the speed of the government that's permitting and licensing. So many of the cities have been furloughed or they've gone on to, you know, non-in-person type of inspections or whatever. And so we're noticing that getting licensed and permitted to get built out, to get your business license, to get a zoning um, update or a CUP is taking a little bit longer just because everybody's so overwhelmed and working remotely. So know those things so that when you're trying to get your lease done, you work that out with your landlord so that your free rent period doesn't start until after your permits are secured, right? Because that can take a long time then you negotiate into your free rent. So things to think about for timing. Now your financial position, like, look, you got to know what you have, right? What do you have in terms of viable cash that you're putting into your business, into the lease, because all rents matter. So we can be looking at base rent. We can be looking at triple nets. And this goes for whether you're leasing space or coming back at the landlord for some kind of a rent uh, relief, right? So when we're looking at a gross lease, all everything all in, right? That's one lump sum. It is what it is. But if you've got that base rent, right? And then you've got the triple nets. The triple nets are the sweet spot, spot for the landlord because those are their hard costs. So when you're trying to negotiate free rent, abated rent, whatever, we need to know what those are because we want to cover that. So if we can cover that in a little bit more, we might have a better way of going at it. So maybe 50% of what you're paying right now, right? So we need to understand that. We also need to understand escalation rates. I kid you not, I saw a lease the other day where they signed it and they didn't catch the fact that the landlord said that every year the, um, the landlord had the right to increase his base rent at a minimum of 4% zero cap. I thought, oh my goodness, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and the landlord did, they doubled their rent. And he's like, well, do I have any recourse? And I said, well, sort of through an attorney, but, but not like automatically, it's not like a, a like you know, residential rent where you can go back and there's a law that says you can't do that. So anyway, so you have to watch for that because you don't want your rent escalating any faster, right? Then your sales can escalate. So we want to make sure that that is appropriate. Now, when we look at that also, we want to go back when we're talking about rent relief or a new lease also, remember that your base rent People get all crazy about market rent. And I just want to just put it in a bag and chuck it over my shoulder because market rent is irrelevant. The rent you pay should be what your business model can afford, right? Otherwise, you shouldn't be renting there. So if you have a restaurant, you can seat 100 people, right? Bottoms and chairs 100 times. And you can turn that three times a day. We know what your average ticket is and we know what you can afford because we are going to project that out to look and see what you do weekly, what you do monthly, right? Then we can look at that and say, look, your rent should be no greater than 10% of your total gross sales. And if that model doesn't work, right, then it doesn't work and we don't lease from that space. It doesn't matter how many dollars per square foot it is. It matters whether or not your business model can afford that. Now, with that said, look at what's happening. If you're going all outdoor dining right now. And so you used to be able to put a hundred bottoms in the chair three times a day. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. You, you brought in a little bit more with delivery and to go and all that stuff. And then these beautiful outdoor dining experiences are being put in, which is great, but maybe there's only 20 seats, right? And because you have to keep them six feet apart and you can only turn it twice a day. So your, your total gross sales dropped a lot. So when you're going back to the landlord to talk about this, you're like, look, it's not about whether it's fair. It's about the business model and what the business can support and what it can actually do. So don't forget that. And then also when you're looking at leasing space, don't forget you have all those other expenses that are fixed, right? Whether you operate or not, you have insurance to pay. You have utilities to pay. And we need to make sure that you have the cash flow to be able to do that. And in the cases where we're doing rent relief, those are part of the conversation with the landlord, right? Of that, hey, look, this person is burning through $15,000, whether they have a sale or not. So let's talk about that so that we can make sure that we don't die on this hill and we have enough runway to get into a place where we can thrive and make profit again. So when we go to them and we talk to them about this rent relief, you know, relief is a really big umbrella. So are we talking about deferred? 
right? Which is the, the, the wimpy model of buying a hamburger. I'll gladly eat my hamburger today and pay you for it another day, right? Or are we going to abate it, which means completely ask for forgiveness and part of it goes away? Are we going to get a temporary or permanent reduction? And we need to be careful about that because a landlord values their property based on the rent roll. Right. And so the valuation of the actual commercial property is done with this crazy, you know, um, equation. But all you need to know is when they permanently restrict or, or bring down your rents, it actually starts devaluing their property. And that's why they're kind of allergic to doing that. You also need to remember that a third party manager gets paid on the percentage of rent collected. Right. So they are a little allergic to reducing you permanently. Also, they'd like to kind of kick it down the street. But we do need to, to look to see. Now, the other thing I tell all my clients is we need to toss the word fair out the window because it doesn't mean anything anymore, right? We all, we all have what we want, but what we're really looking for now after a year of this pandemic is to express what we need. And it's different, want and need, right? So we're not looking for fair, we're looking for reasonable. Does this make sense to the business model? Right. I've had some clients come to me saying, well, I want rent relief. And I would go through the thing and I'm like, you know, I don't really see that you need it. And then they're like, well, everybody else is getting it. So I want it. And it's like, well, <laughs> Tio, that's not what we're doing. Right. So we want to make sure that it meets the model and the current conditions. Recapture right is a thing that's out there. So that might be good for you if the landlord says, hey, look, if I do rent relief for you, I'm going to be able to recapture with a 30 day notice your space if I can get somebody that's that's qualified to pay market rent or what they want to be market rent, right? That could be good. That could not be good. It depends on how long you want to be there, right? Do you really want to go? And is that possible? So you also need, we help you uh, put together projections to see when and if you ever really can afford your lease stated rents again, how long do you need to hold on so that you can take that PPP, you can take your idle, you can take your grant money, you can take your other loans, and we can help you spread it to see where you can actually get to. How long can you hang on? What does that really look like, right? So, and then when can you start paying back those deferrals? Because right now there's a lot of people who have deals that were done last year where the deferral needed to start being paid back in January and they're still closed. And it's like, how do we do? that. So we need to go back to the landlord and do that. Or if it's a new lease or we're downsizing or doing something else, how long can we go where maybe we just pay those triple nets, right? Until we can get into a place where we can open up to customers again and start developing that sales channel. So the, oh, the other thing too, I have so many people that say, look, I just, you know, I have a handshake deal with my landlord. He said it was okay. I have an email good to go. And I'm like, no, you're actually technically still in default because until that email, until that conversation gets memorialized and attached to the lease through an amendment or an addendum, you're actually technically legally in default. And the reason that that's bad is, and I'm seeing this happen, is the landlord sells or a new management company comes in and then they manage to the letter of the lease, not to the spirit of what had happened before, or the landlords are losing their property. They're going back to the bank or they're going into bankruptcy and the bankruptcy courts or the banks can reject your lease if you're in default or make you come whole all at once if you wanted to stay. And that's not the whole point of this, right? So make sure that you're getting it documented. All right. So you're in a space, you're like, I can't hold on. I really, really, really need to sell my business. Or I really, really, really need somebody else to come in and run it or run out of half of my square footage, right? So that's assignment or subletting. You can't just sell your business without the landlord allowing you to assign the lease, right? So we want to look at that use clause. Before you get all crazy talking to people about buying and assuming your lease, we need to look at that use clause. I've got landlords that will not assign something outside of the franchise that is running in that space, right? Or the fact that it is a yogurt store. They want it to be a yogurt store and you can't do ice cream and you can't do tacos and you can't do hot dogs and you can't do any other food, right? So we need to know whether or not the use clause is flexible. That's if you're leasing space too right now, right? If you're going into lease space, let's make sure you've got some flexibility in there that it's not tied necessarily to a franchise or a brand in case you lose it because franchises are going out right now and some of them are collapsing and then we want to make sure that we know what the exclusivity clauses are everybody thinks they want an exclusivity clause but on a property that has a lot of them you can't do anything else because you're going to tromp on somebody else's exclusivity clause so you need to know that before you go in now the landlord has the right and, um, and the need to approve your assignment. What we want if you're negotiating a new lease is to make sure that the clause in there is that it may not be unreasonably withheld. There's that reasonableness again, right? Versus the sole discretion of the landlord because 
you know, in, in, in every population, 2% of the people can be knuckleheads, right? So if you have a knucklehead landlord, we want to make sure that he doesn't have sole discretion to just kill your deal. And I've seen that happen quite a lot lately, just because landlords are kind of out of control a little bit too. And it's fear-based, right? They're human. Everybody's human. So we want to assign when, even if we are in default, because there's a lot of language that precludes that too. And then don't forget, you probably personally guaranteeing that clause. What does it look like? If you're signing a lease, let's see if we can sunset that guarantee so that you don't have to take it clear into, you know, um, 30 years from now that maybe it sunsets at five years or 10 years. But if you have one now, we need to talk about that because that could be a sticking point. If you go to assign it, we want to get rid of that, right? Make sure that that person that's assigning actually has the wherewithal to take on at least without you staying on there. Now, the disaster and pandemic mitigation, every one of us knows that force majeure had nothing to do with the price of tea in China or the antics of Daffy Duck when the COVID hit, right? So force majeure doesn't have the right language. And so we need to make sure we have pandemic language in there now that, that mitigates if this comes back around. I've, I've been successful uh, getting language in there. I've got some clauses that we've been using that have been approved by attorneys and different landlords that we, we kind of submit. But one of the things is we just really need to talk about some of these uh, yeah buts you know what happens if this kind of stuff happens again and I just know when you are looking to do that whether it's a brand new lease a renewal <clears throat> or relief landlords are allergic to looking too far into the future they don't want to play the what if game they want to know what they're doing now and they want stop gaps to measure because they really like reality so um so those are my five buckets of things that we need to pay attention to with commercial leasing I know that felt like you're probably drinking from a fire hose, but um, I'm available to work with clients through the SBDC on uh, negotiating their, their leases and their rent relief and understanding the process. Back to you, Mike. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carrie. And, you know, that's a wealth of information um, for anybody that has a commercial lease. Um, you know, you can contact us directly and you can work with Carrie and the rest of our teams. Um, I'm quickly going to cover two, two programs. I'm going to turn it over to, to Paul Nolta right after that. So the first one is the California Rebuilding Fund. So this is a loan program that is out there and it's being run through the state of California and through the Community Development Financial Institutions or the, the CDFIs. And so it is up to $100,000 loan at 4.25% interest up to 60 months. Um, you apply directly to this link and I will put it in the chat box just so that you're aware. And so the way it works is you take three months of 2019 revenues and whatever those three months are, that's what you qualify for up to $100,000. And so I'll give you a little more information on it um, in the chat box, like I said, but it is, a, it is a loan program out there. And it's, you know, there's roughly about $37.5 million in the program. Um, and the, the hope here is that it will turn into a much larger program and will be able to be accessed by all small business owners throughout the state of California. Um, and then I'm gonna cover the, the last program, which is the California Relief Grant. And so, we were kind of the front end of this program. This is a state run program that um, was administered by Lendistry, who is a community development financial institution as well. Um, there was originally $500 million in the program. Uh, businesses could, could, would qualify for either a five, 15 or $25,000 grant, depending on the size of the revenue from 2019. Um, I know a lot of people were frustrated as, as you went through it. Um, there were a little over 450,000 applications. Um, the first round, um, is done. The second round is currently being administered. And so you should, if you applied for it, um, you should be receiving the, either that you receive the grant or that you're put on the waiting list. Um, so good news to, to this grant is that the, the state of California and the governor ha have just put an additional $2 billion into this. So that will be rolling into this program in the next couple of weeks. And so there will be a couple more rounds. Um, if you need help understanding where you're at, um, most likely if you applied, you're probably on the, on the wait list. Um, there were just so many people that applied for it and such a big need um, that that's why they decided to put uh, a whole lot more funding into this program. Um, but if you need some help, you can definitely contact us directly and I will try to get you information as to where you're at. Um, I would say hold tight. You should be receiving an email directly from Lendistry um, in the next couple of days as to whether, you're, whether you received the second round grant or you're put on the wait list. Um, and then we'll get information over the next week or two as to the next, the third round and possibly fourth round, if there's going to be one, and then just what they're going to do with the $2 billion that have been put into this program. But, you know, the good news is, is that there's more money coming into it and pot potentially even more money after that. So, you know, hold tight, you know, th this program hopefully will, will touch every business that, that applies. Um, I, I can't guarantee it. It's outside of my control, but it is there. And, you know, we, we are definitely, you know, the front end of this. So if there's any way that we can help you, just let me know. 
Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to Paul Nolta, who is the director of our Inland Empire SBDC. He's going to walk you through a lot of what you just heard, how you can connect with us and get help. Um, but I'm going to turn over to Paul. So, Paul. And you're on mute, Paul. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to find the right. <laughs> Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I, I just want to kind of summer uh, close with uh, from the SBD side, the SBDC side. You know, you've heard so much information coming at you from from our you know our experts on the panel, and know that we have what do we have up to a hundred of these experts now on our team throughout the two county, two two regions, Orange County and Inland Empire, that are there to work with you on a one on one basis. So you know, we we give you the information, we educate you in this platform but really take that opportunity to engage with our team. And so the small business development centers are really here to, to do um, three key things. And that's either to help you start a business, maintain it, or help you expand operations. And how we do that is really three key ways. And one of them is education such as today. We do close to 200 workshops a year um, that are all free for you to access. Hopefully soon we'll have an online portal where you can come on in your convenience, click on it and, and view the training at, at your leisure. But for now, go onto our website, um, click on the training tab, take a look at the calendar of events and programs that we have coming up. Everything from HR topics to marketing to um, e-commerce. So tons of opportunities for you to educate yourself. But the second part, is really about that one-on-one -on -one engagement. So we have a team of consultants that are there to work with you one-on-one -on -one and provide that assistance. You know, we partner with the county, Rob, you know, we couldn't do what we do without their, their help. And, and we've worked with them for years. And, and so we are a resource of theirs and, and tap into us. We are there to work one-on-one -on -one with you. You know, as we're seeing a lot of these questions pop up in, in the thing, you know, a lot of you are, are one-offs. So we cover this stuff in material, but you're very unique. Every business is very unique. And so please reach out, schedule, or just a phone call or email away to uh, get that one-on-one -on -one engagement so we can look at your case and walk you through what, what your options are. Um, so that one-on-one -on -one is a big part of it. And then last is a link to resources. So whether you, you know, want to find out what loan package or what grant is, is best for you, we can hopefully help streamline that. Whether that's license and permits, getting in front of the right lenders, um, a lot of those things we're there to help with. Um, again, you know, the expansion side, procurement, finding customers, engaging, updating your marketing, building a strategic plan, you know, please reach out. We're, we're again, we're there to help. And that's mine. Perfect. Thank you so much, Paul. And, and with that, um, I put our, our contact information in the chat if you need help from any of us. Or as Paul mentioned, we have a team of 120, you know, business owners and business experts all here to help you all at no cost to you. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Rob Moran and the supervisor, and thank you guys so much for including us in your in your town hall. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that. And um, wanted to reinforce to all the the attendees that this will this webinar is recorded again and will be on our YouTube channel. Um, it's on Facebook. Uh, now, Mike and Paul, you do these webinars uh, pretty frequently and you modify them as new requirements come up, whether it's PPP or the state grant program. So uh, if you'd like to tune in to future webinars, you can access that uh, at uh, Mike's, uh, I, I think he put his link in the, in the chat. Uh, I think you do these on a daily basis or pretty close to a daily basis as new and updated information comes out. And I think uh, the California Relief Grant is, is the big one with the $2 billion that's coming up. And then as new federal resources um, come up and, and we're anticipating something, not exactly sure what's going to happen in the relief package. Uh, but once we get more information, of course, we will be sharing it through social media. Uh, the supervisor always puts this out through her newsletter and her social media channels as well. So there's hopefully this is all getting to you one way or another. So we're, we're pleased to do that. So thanks a lot, Mike, uh, for doing this. And I think there's a few questions in the, the Q&A, if maybe you could take a look at those before we close out. Um, and I, I think you may have answered some of these, but just in case, I'd really appreciate that. And, and again, thank you to all of our panelists and 
Supervisor Spiegel, thank you again for, for hosting this and putting this together. We appreciate your support and uh, I'll turn it over to you for closing remarks. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you, Mike and Craig and Paul and Carrie. Thank you all for your expertise, your knowledge and sharing of resources. And that's one thing I wanted to say to everybody who's um, here on this call is that there is a lot of resources available. Please check into it, fill your toolbox with information. It is so important to find out what's out there because there is stuff that you may not be aware of. I wasn't aware of everything that was talked today and I talk to these folks on a regular basis. It's really important that we help you succeed. Sometimes we won't always have the right answer, but we hope to get you an answer. And um, we look forward to being able to share in the future, uh, help you. Please keep in touch. Um, as I said in the box, there was a way to get our monthly newsletter. We have Facebook page and we now have a leadership um, updates. So if you'd like to be part of that, those are emails and we have periodic uh, webinars also for that group. Uh, we just wanna give as much information to help you be successful, whether it's a nonprofit, it's a business, even in your personal life, because there's opportunities, but if you don't know what the resources are, you can't um, obtain them. So we're here to help you. We want you to be successful and have a wonderful day and looking forward to talking to you soon. Thank you very much, Supervisor. Just wanted to reinforce, uh, you've got a lot of information in the, in the chat. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Riverside County Business and Community Services Department. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook. Uh, we put our website uh, link in the chat. And so thank you again. And again, this is just the beginning. If, if you haven't engaged with us before, you've got some tremendous resources that you're already investing in and that are no additional costs. So don't hesitate. And again, thank you again, Supervisor Spiegel. Thank you to um, Mike Daniel and the team from the SBDC. Uh, it, it really is a, a very fruitful partnership. And, and thank you all for attending. And this will conclude the webinar.